sleep and it's also going to get recorded. So it might not be a lunch and learn for you. It might be a evening and learn or a morning and learn. But um, either way, whenever you watch this, we are glad that you are here and you are welcome here. Um, my name is Ashley Pennypacker Hill, and I'm our Director of Student and Family Services, and I am going to let our panelists introduce themselves. Ms. Becca? Hi, I'm Becca Antelis, and I'm the Elementary School Counselor. Ms. Madison? Hello, I'm Madison Schmidt. I'm the 6th through 8th Middle School Counselor. And Ms. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Tice. I'm one of the high school counselors. I handle kids' last name. Uh, K through Z. And Mr. Bryce? I'm Bryce Stevenson. I'm a K through 12 mental health counselor. And Ms. Julie? Hi everybody, I'm Julie Henderson and I'm the communications director at PK. All right, so a few things before we get started. So as you might be able, or you've already noticed, um, participants, your screens will not show up because we are in a webinar. So it's a little bit different than like a regular Zoom session. Um, also, we want you to be able to ask questions in this. So if you have questions, you can see at the bottom, there's a place that says Q&A. So that's the place that you would ask questions. So you can ask them throughout. Um, we are not gonna answer them throughout though. At the very end of our presentation, we will look through the questions and we will answer the questions that we have. If we don't get to your question, um, we will be able to answer it um, as a posting um, when we post this recording. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna share my screen. And here we go. All right, so we're here today to talk about self-care, what it is and what it can do for you. However, before jumping into all of that, I think it'd be unfair of us to talk about self-care without talking about the unpre unprecedented times we're in right now. We're in a pandemic, which is new to all of us, and it's tested us and challenged us in ways we could have never predicted. And so some of us might have not have even had a chance to think about self-care while we're in a pandemic, and that is okay. And I hope we can all give ourselves some grace because we're just all trying to get through it too. So I really wanted to start off with that. And so overall today, we're gonna be going over um, the six domains, um, talking a little bit about what self-care is, how it can impact you, um, the goals to have it be maintained. But like I said, it can, it's gonna look different depending on the context we're in. And it can really help balance you out by addressing kind of all of your needs in those different domains. But little disclaimer here, the goal is definitely not to tell you what you should be doing or that there's one right way of doing this. Um, it's just a reminder that sometimes we need to rem remind ourselves if there's an opportunity to do so to put that oxygen mask on ourselves first and before we go and be there for others. All right, so here on this graphic here is our self-care wheel. So these are those six domains I mentioned. So there's physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, personal, and professional. And all of these are unique to each individual person and each individual family unit. And so for students, the professional one might be their job um, or their being a student, sorry. <laughs> Um, because those are their certain responsibilities that they have right now. And so when thinking about self-care in that domain, um, it might be fulfilling, uh, addressing the certain responsibilities and how those impact your life. All right, but when we think about each domain, it's important for us to think about how we care for ourselves. We might have a tendency to just focus on one specific one and that, oh, if you could go back to the other slide, Ashley. Um, we might have a, we might just focus on one particular one that might be around tendencies or what we're comfortable with. So you maybe if you're focusing more on the physical one, you might go for walks, make sure you're getting enough sleep, maybe you get to exercise. Um, but if you notice that you're still being left drained, overwhelmed, exhausted, there might be some of these other domains that are neglected 
or should be um, also addressed. Oops, sorry. Um, all right, so if we could go to the next slide, Ashley. So why self-care? So as um, a caregiver, sometimes it can be really easy to just focus on talking uh, or on taking care of others. Um, that's your go-to. And it might, you might have to ask yourself what others need, but you aren't always asking yourself what your needs are. And so it's this idea of filling up your own cup as others are emptying it, because we're always going to have things that are emptying our cup. Um, but what can we do to make sure we're filling up ours? And so this is for yourselves, and this is also as a family as well. All right. Thank you. So there's this idea, this kind of buzzword that I think we've all heard the last couple of years, and it's mindfulness. And mindfulness and self-care kind of go hand in hand. So this idea of mindfulness is that you are fully present in the here and now, so in the current moment. And it's about awareness. So being aware, being in that here and now of what you're feeling, what you're thinking, maybe what's going through your mind. And it goes hand in hand with self-care because it's how we start to determine where we need to adjust practices in our lives to maybe fit in more self-care or maybe try out new things in self-care. Um, like for example, from the wheel, I know I practice a lot of exercises, self-care and like physical work, but doing that over and over again doesn't always work um, for me in self-care. And so I have to address kind of the other domains, maybe like the emotional domains or even the spiritual and spending more time outside. And so this mindfulness piece is about engaging in this awareness and really looking into ourselves and figuring out what is it that we need in order to feel energized and feel more like ourselves so that we can better help others, our children, our partners, our community. And mindfulness is absolutely attainable. I know when I first heard about mindfulness, I thought it was all about meditating for hours on end. And I was like, that's just not something I have time to do. And I don't have the energy to do that. But mindfulness is not just a uh, it's a way of life. It's not just like a one-off thing or it's not dedicating hours. It's a way of life. And mindfulness can be a moment to yourself and saying, I wonder how am I feeling right now? Or how did this situation make me feel? Or what's going through my head right now? So it's very much something that you can practice each day. Um, and we're actually going to engage in a mindful moment right now. It's something I like to use frequently with students, with faculty, and it's called a body scan. So this is going to be three minutes. So I encourage you to engage in this practice with me. So go ahead and find a comfortable spot, maybe in your chair, or if you're standing, or if you're in the car. Feel the contact of your body with the chair, or the cushion, or the ground. Sense your upper legs, your lower legs, and your feet. Notice if there are any particular places in your body that call out for attention. Places where sensations feel most vibrant, dynamic, tense or light. And scan your body and see if there are places where there is a lack of sensation or only a faint sensation. Now sense your whole body breathing Take a deep breath in through your nose and then slowly bring it, breathe it out. Maybe focus on any thoughts that float into your head. 
You may just acknowledge them and simply let them flow away as you breathe in and breathe out. Notice any sensations in your belly, in your chest, in your arms, in your fingers. Move up to your shoulders, in your neck, all the way to the top of your head. Breathing in deeply through your nose, exhaling through your mouth. Now look at your whole body. Notice what tensions, thoughts, or feelings arise. Take in a few more deep breaths. You may rejoin us. And so again, a body scan can be something that's quick. It can be a little more in depth, but it's a good way to kind of see like where, where am I maybe feeling tension in my body? I tend to feel it in my shoulders. I know some people might feel it in their legs, in their neck, even in their chest. Um, and it, it's only, it was three minutes. So it's a good amount of time, a short amount of time, and it kind of gets the job done and then it helps you move along and figure out what self-care am I needing? And it's really good with kids too. So thank you for doing that with me. And so there's this idea of a self-care plan. Um, this comes from the University of Buffalo. And it's this idea the same way that we have a plan maybe at school for when we have to do a fire drill or for when we go out to recess or even I think about lunch because it was just lunchtime. What happens at lunch? We have a plan. The same thing kind of goes with self-care. And so it's important when committing to self-care and doing self-care that you're planning it out. And that can include things that you do for self-care currently, things that work for you, maybe something you would like to try differently, maybe a domain that you don't do as much in. I don't really do much in the spiritual domain, so that's one that I would like to try and do more of. And then thinking about what prevents you from engaging in self-care. And I would say the biggest one is time, right? It's hard to find enough time in the day to get everything done on top of feeling like now I gotta take care of myself. But maybe what other barriers prevent you from engaging in self-care? Thanks, Becca. Um, so the first step kind of in realizing your plan is figuring out where you are now at the beginning of it, figuring out what is important to you, figuring out how you are kind of dealing with things right now. And so the University of Buffalo also created this self-care assessment that we're going to go through briefly. Um, it's really helpful because it helps you identify those needs that you have. Um, it's also really cool because by identifying those needs, those needs are also activities that you can do. So if you realize that you're not getting enough exercise, a way to correct that need would be to get more exercise. Um, it's broken into the six domains we've been talking about, physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, relationship, and professional. Um, there's a lot of text on the next few slides, so don't feel like you need to absorb all of it right now and don't feel like you have to have a running tally right now. We will provide the full assessment um, and follow-up communications after this is over. If you're going through this after the fact and you can pause your video, that would be great if you wanted to pause on each of these slides and really kind of give a lot of thought into what is there. The first one is physical self-care and we'll go through. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, a lot of them are pretty straightforward. I'm gonna highlight and I'm inviting all of you also to kind of listen to yourself and think about which one of these kind of stand out to you because they're surprising and they're not things that you would think of as being a part of self-care or taking care of yourself. Um, for this one, 
Again, eating regularly, getting enough sleep, exercise, those seem pretty straightforward. Something that really surprised me was wearing clothes I like, something I wouldn't have thought of as being important, uh, uh, possibly contributing to your physical self-care. But after thinking about it, after seeing it written down in this assessment and thinking about it, wow, yeah, you can get a lot of benefit from simply wearing clothes that you enjoy. So this is psychological self-care. Um, what really stands out for me here, noticing my inner experience, listening to my thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, and feelings. That could be one of the barriers you may have identified making a plan of even just, I don't even know where I stand. I don't even know what I need. I don't even know how I feel about any of this stuff. Simply noticing your experience can really be a good first step. And if you're always helping other people, you're always go, go, go. It may not, it may be hard to notice your experience. So even just being prompted to notice your experience can be a very mindful activity to help you develop some of these other knowledges. Um, do something I wish I'm not an expert or in charge of. This really stood out to me too and not something I would have thought about just because throughout our day, we're doing all these things that we're good at and we're not used to engaging maybe the creative part of our mind or trying to figure things out. We're just doing kind of the path of least resistance to get through. For some people, doing something you're not an expert or in charge of may be something that is a need for you, something you need to do to be able to feel your psychological best. So emotional self-care, I mean, all of these are important, but this feels especially important right now. Um, giving yourself affirmations and praising yourself. If this is something you don't do a lot of, this is probably a blind spot for you. And so again, this assessment can help you go through and find these things of, wow, I never even think about praising myself or I maybe thought that I praised myself, but when actually having to think about it in this context, I realized, wow, I really don't do that. And maybe I, I put myself down a lot. Finding things that make me laugh. Laughter has been proven to be a huge curative factor for a lot of things. And so just finding things to laugh about in these times, especially compared with the last one I've highlighted here, expressing outrage and social action, letters, donations, marches or protests. There's a lot happening that could be causing us to feel bad and feeling uncertain and feeling powerless. And a way to kind of get that power back is to do something with that feeling. Spiritual self-care. Uh, so making time for reflection. Spirituality can be a lot of things to a lot of different people, but I think at its core, you can make time for reflection as a very kind of simple, easy, kind of basic step that you can always do and build upon from there. And then cherishing optimism and hope, again, with things going bad, with people feeling stressed out, cherishing optimism and hope is something that may not occur to you. And so simply being reminded of optimism and hope can be very helpful. Relationship self-care. Um, this is kind of a family webinar and the family unit is full of relationships. And so a lot of these are great, especially for making self-care a priority for the entire family. Um, something that stood out for me, allowing others to do things for me. Um, I, this is really tough for me just in general of like, I want to feel like I can do everything. I want to feel capable. Someone else doing something for me feels odd, but maybe you may need that to help yourself take care. Maybe that's how they can show that they care about you through their relationship. And so that's something that just stood out to me is again, this thing you wouldn't think of without being reminded of it in, in this sort of context. And then finally, workplace or professional self-care. So this whole assessment can be viewed through a couple lenses. It can be through you personally and how you are doing. It can also be viewed through as a family and it can be viewed through how your students are kind of going through this. And so while you have a profession, you have a job, you have kind of responsibilities, uh, Madison brought this up a little bit. Your students can almost think of school as their job, as their responsibilities. And so this can be very helpful for them too. Um, identifying projects or tasks that are exciting and rewarding, I think is very, very enriching for me, how I thought of, of hey, this is kind of coming back to that optimism and hope of, wow, I really enjoy this project and here's why I enjoy it and doing and being reminded of what is engaging about it. And then arranging workspace that's comfortable and, and comforting. Um, again, if you're gonna be spending all this time working, it, it's important to really be intentional about your space and making it, when you're spending so much time, making it as comfortable as possible. 
little thing like maybe adding a pillow to your chair or adding some light, something like that can really make a big difference with how you're feeling. So again, um, I hope some of these stood out to you as maybe you recognize, wow, I'm really, really good at that. Or wow, I hadn't even thought of that as something that I'm missing in my life. I really want to do something about that. We will provide these to you after the fact, and you can always go through. They will give you a prompt about how to go through and assign values to these that you can identify numerically, maybe what is missing for you. But also if something you read as we were going through here stood out as like, wow, I never really made quiet time to complete tasks, for instance. Feel free to, to give yourself what you need and what you deserve and give yourself that quiet time or whatever else kind of stood out in this exercise. Thank you, Bryce. Um, I think we're gonna shift gears a little bit. So we wanted to talk about um, how do we uh, do self-care as a family? So these are just some suggestions of things that, that we've done with our families or things that we've heard other people do. Um, at my house, family movie night has become very popular. Um, it's something that, that my child looks forward to and it's something consistent that he knows is coming. So it gives us uh, something that we can put up kind of a, a, a place on the calendar and he knows, okay, on the weekend nights, we're gonna watch X, Y, Z. And we've been able to kind of share with him some of our 80s classics that he uh, probably would never have had an opportunity to see otherwise. So uh, even with older kids, that might be a fun activity uh, maybe getting them to pick the movie and then they get to share something with you guys that you wouldn't normally have time to maybe all do as a family. Um, and it doesn't have to be fancy, but it could be. Like you could have themed family movie nights. You could have themed snacks. You could do a whole bunch of different things with it if you wanted to, or you could just put on Disney Plus and hit the first family movie that everybody agrees on. So it can be as, as uh, elaborate as you like or as simple as you want to make it. Um, we talked a lot about physical health, and so trying to get kids out and away from their screens, so trying to get them outside. I know the weather is still really hot, but if you can pick that time, maybe in the later evening before it gets dark, that might be time for a family walk or a family bike ride. Um, one of the other things that we've done at my house is we have a lot of like backyard games. So we've done cornhole tournaments, we've done frisbee, we've done bocce ball. Um, again, things that maybe normally wouldn't be exciting, but if you can make it into a challenge, it kind of becomes more special. Uh, we've also been doing uh, some new traditions. So not only are we doing the, the movie nights, but every Friday is uh, Donut Friday at our house. So I get up a little early and I go and I make a run and I get donuts, but I also do something for me and get fancy coffee. So that's something that my child really looks forward to and it kind of gets them up with a spring and a step on Fridays. And if there are things like that that you can incorporate for your family, that would be great. Um, video games are a very big part of a lot of kids' lives and I think we all have different feelings about it, but that is sometimes a good way to connect with the other people in your home. If there's like a two player game or a team game you guys can play, or maybe even a way for them to connect with other friends and family that aren't at the house that they can play online. Uh, maybe they can still have some of that social interaction with other people that aren't in your family unit at your home. Uh, some other good things that we've tried, cooking special meals, maybe more treats and snacks, things like that, that they can help plan a menu or they can help with the shopping. Uh, giving the kids the agency to come up with some of that has been really good and they're learning some good independent skills while you're doing that. There are a ton of different things you can do, and we encourage you to do the thing that makes sense in the moment. Like, this does not need to be one more thing for you to do, but if it's something that you could just like tweak a little bit, it really helps um, kind of bring them together with you, give them something to look forward to, kind of establish a new routine. We've started doing um, books together as a family, like we're reading the Harry Potter series together as a family, and then we're gonna watch the movies. So even with your older kids, they've got to read things for class. Maybe, maybe you could be reading what they're reading and do like a family book club. So, right. go ahead. So we are so grateful for everybody to um, be with us live today. And also we're grateful to the families who are going to be able to watch this back um, and not have it be live. Because we know, we know that life is, busy and full right now. Um, 
I also just want to thank our panelists. So Becca and Sarah and Madison and Bryce, they are a amazing resource here at this school. And so if you haven't met them or sent them an email or worked with them, they are here for you. And so please make sure that you reach out to them. Um, we're all here for you. We know that they're, this is quite a different time for all of us, um, an uncertain time. And we miss having the way things used to be. And so we're gonna continue to do these family webinars to stay connected. Even though we may be physically distant, um, we don't wanna be socially distant from any of you. Um, we know that some of you are at home uh, with, your, with your students and some of you we get to see when you drop your students off here at school. So we're all over the place, um, but we still want to work really hard to stay connected. So um, we appreciate your time and please reach out to us. If you uh, maybe are watching this and you might say, I don't know where to find this. If you go to the Student and Family Services website, all of our family webinars are going to be posted there. Um, also, if you go there, you can look and we see we have a schedule for the other webinars that are coming up. So if you can, please join us um, live or always watch it as a recording. We will post everything um, as we go along. All right. Let's check out some of these questions. See here. So we have one question that's asking who do I contact when I have questions? Um, is it uh, Miss Penny Packer Hill, my child's cohort teacher, my child's counselor? That's a really good question. Um, and I think it's it seems it seems crazy that we're even, you know, we have to ask a question like that, but it makes a lot of sense because we're, things are different. The structures are different. School is quite different now. I mean, even the concept of a cohort teacher, that might not even make sense to what every, to the, everybody that's listening right now. So cohort teachers are secondary teachers that are on campus that are um, watching the secondary students do their Zoom sessions. <laughs> So if you're an elementary parent, a co the cohort teacher might not make sense to you. So who do I contact? I think it depends on the situation. So if there's a question about a course, I always suggest contacting the teacher first. I will, even if a parent comes to me, for example, my very first question almost always is gonna be, have you contacted the teacher? So if it's about a course, I would contact the teachers. If it's about um, mental health, or um, stress, or um, organization, or things of those matters, I would suggest contacting the school counselors um, or Mr. Stevenson. Um, and then you can see on our Student Family Services website, you'll be able to see who you should contact, because you might be like, well, I see all of these people, who am I supposed to contact? Um, you'll be able to see who is your person um, that's connected to your student. And then in terms of your cohort teacher, I don't know if I, if, I don't know the reasons maybe you would contact your cohort teacher. Maybe if there's something that's going on um, for that day in particular, and it has to do with uh, maybe the, the teacher who's going to physically be with them that day, maybe you send them an email. But in general, I don't know about contacting the cohort teacher very often. I think it's, it's mainly um, counselors, or the actual teacher or the administrators, you're always welcome to contact me or contact Dr. Geiger or Christy Gabbard. Um, so I hope that that answers that question. Let's see. Another question is, how do you recognize stress in teenagers around COVID? I'm gonna open that up to our panelists. I think it depends. I think we actually have a webinar coming up around this exact topic, um, but it definitely depends on your student or your child. When I think about stress in teenagers, I think about them, excuse me, not doing the activities maybe that they enjoy the most, um, that lack of interest in those things that used to interest them. 
And then I also think in terms of stress, maybe like irritability, but like more so like teenagers are already kind of like going through a lot physically and hormonally, but like that increased irritability, maybe even around small things, um, getting really upset over something that might seem a little bit insignificant to us. Those are kind of like the two main monikers for stress in teenagers to me. I don't know if anybody else wanted to chime in though. I would say trying to open up that communication, which sometimes can be hard with a teenager. I know if you ask them, what'd you do today? It's like, ah, but if you can um, <clears throat> maybe make that part of your regular check-in with them and you're not going to necessarily say, are you stressed? But if you share about your day and, and the trials and the tribulations you're having, sometimes that opens up the door for them to feel more comfortable. Yeah. You know, this thing happened and, and then it kind of gives you a sense of how they're really feeling. So I would just, even if, if they don't give you much initially, if you keep making that part of like normal course of evening dinner, or, you know, when you first see each other after you're home from work, just start opening that dialogue and letting them know, like everyone's feeling, feeling these feelings right now. And it's normal to be feeling overwhelmed or it's normal to be feeling stressed, but you want to make sure that you're checking in with them so you can see if it's becoming um, too big for them to handle. And touching on that too, for my, I can speak for myself when I'm stressed and how it showed up as a teenager too was I, I was avoidant. I would kind of shut down. And so sometimes with school, we might wonder, are they just not motivated? Do they just not want to do their school work? It, but really it might be that they're completely overwhelmed and they don't even know where to start. So they're just avoiding anything that adds more stress and putting that in a box and sit it in somewhere else. So also looking for maybe changes in some of those things if that's not um, typical of your student. I agree with everything that's been said. Um, the only thing I would add is, again, connecting with your student and asking them, hey, how is this affecting you? How is it going to school with all of this happening? Um, and even modeling some vulnerability of, I am feeling affected. I am feeling tired, stressed, worried, scared, fill in the blank of how you are feeling and show them that, hey, it's okay to feel this way. Um, and that should open up that, that lane of communication and really help you build a connection that is strong and you can get that information from. We have another question and it's a, from a parent who has a middle schooler and a high schooler. And they're just concerned with the amount of homework that their students are receiving. So in terms of self-care, what panelists, what would you all recommend um, in terms of that parent being able to help that student or those students? One of the things that comes to mind first is on Canvas, you see everything all at once. It's all my classes, all my to-dos, all of that can be really overwhelming. Um, but sometimes helping them make it more in bite-sized chunks. Like we're not asking you to do everything do next week. What is it right now? One thing we could do right now um, and accomplish. So making it those smaller pieces and then they can celebrate those as well, um, which is a win for them that they can acknowledge. I would also first reach out to each individual teacher and try to get a sense of what their expectations are and let them know like, hey, I just wanna know, you know, this is how much time I'm seeing my child spend on this assignment. What is typical, what is expected? Is this like the pattern moving forward? Like, are they always gonna have vocabulary words on Monday? Are they always gonna have a project due every Friday? Like just getting a sense of what is expected so you can help your kids manage that, but also giving the teacher that feedback because remember, they're used to them being bell to bell from eight to 2.30 basically. And so kids are seeing things as homework that's really teachers are thinking of as classwork because they're only teaching that, that first 45 minutes, but then they're being expected to still be working in that subject for the next 45 minutes. And so if they're not using that time sometimes, um, then it kind of piles up at the end of the day. So I know uh, I talked to a lot of my kids in advisory today and it was very much, some kids were feeling like they were getting piled on. Some were, kids were feeling it was pretty light still. Um, I think having them 
look at their day and look at their week because like Wednesdays, it seems like they have a lot of independent work time and see where they can fit in those assignments that are regularly coming up. I also think about breaking things down into chunks, just like Madison said, but like in the process of doing homework, you know, when we talk about self-care, I don't know if we mentioned this, but we're not saying go off and get a massage for four hours. We're saying, you know, take some time to take care of yourself and that can be five or 10 minutes. So maybe they work on homework for 30 to 40 minutes and they take a 10 minute break in between. And that way they can, you know, get energized to maybe keep doing homework or just recognizing like, it's time I take a break and maybe not do any more homework for right now. Um, so I think breaking it down might also be really helpful for them, kind of like when they're in the weeds of doing their work. I very much agree with that. And, and in talking to kids, they'll tell me, oh, I spent six hours on this assignment. And I'll say, how much of that time was actually working on the assignment? And then they'll be able to sit back and go, mm, that was like an hour or two, but it was all these other things going on but where they said they were working on the assignment, but maybe they were getting distracted over here or distracted over there. So having them being able to figure out when is the best time for me to work? Like, when am I gonna be freshest? When am I going to be able to concentrate the best? Cause it might not be, you know, it's scheduled work time. It may be later in the day, or it may be things that they'd rather do on the weekend potentially, but just kind of working with, with their new schedule and having them figure that out and, and making them take breaks too. Like if your kids are up late working on assignments, again, doesn't have to be a four hour break, but even a 15 minute for a snack might be refreshing and then they can come back and actually get more done because they've had that break. Yeah, thank you. And then there's one other question and this is not necessarily about self-help, but I do wanna make sure that it gets answered. So it's asking, they're asking, can students change their cohort rooms? And again, so that ba is back to the secondary model of on-campus students are in small cohorts. And so the answer to that is no, students cannot change their cohort rooms. And that's because of the exposure, the limited exposure and COVID. Um, it's not our favorite way of doing school by any means. Um, but it's the way that um, we have to be doing it right now to make sure that we're keeping everybody in our community safe. So if there are situations with your cohort teacher, I would recommend reaching out to that cohort teacher and problem solving with them. Our teachers are so open and willing to working with everybody. Um, so that would be my suggestion around cohort teachers. All right. Well, we appreciate you all being with us today and check back on some other webinars because we will be posting them. Thank you.